Hi, everyone. Welcome to our grossing rounds. Here is today's specimen. I'll put up our first polling question. So what specimen is this? Okay, so I'm going to end the polling there and share the results with you. So it is in fact a radical prostatectomy specimen. So now we'll go through some of the anatomy related to the prostate gland. So the prostate is located in front of the rectum and lies directly inferior to the bladder. The normal size of a prostate in an adult man is about the size of a walnut. And for those of you who don't know what a walnut looks like, here's an image here. So there's a walnut, and then in comparison to a ping pong ball, which is about the same size, and then in comparison to a tennis ball, which is quite a bit larger. So our specimen here is obviously a bit bigger than a walnut and closer to the size of about a small tennis ball. With a radical prostatectomy specimen, we get our prostate gland, which is this here. And then we'll also get a portion of the seminal vesicles as well as the vasa deferentia. So our seminal vesicles here, you can see the little bits coming off. So this one would be our left seminal vesicle. And then our right seminal vesicle here is a bit smaller. Other important landmarks to identify on our prostate gland would be the base of the prostate, which is this area here. This would be the most superior portion of the prostate gland, and this is where the bladder would have sat. Then directly opposite to the base is the apex, and that would be the most inferior portion of the prostate gland. Running straight through the middle of the prostate gland is the prostatic urethra. So you can see that here. So for our specimen today, it's out for prostate cancer. Prostate adenocarcinoma is the most common malignancy of the prostate gland. It's the most common cancer in Canadian men, excluding non-melanoma skin cancers. Prostate cancer accounts for one-fifth of all new cancer cases in men, and it's estimated that about one in eight Canadian men will develop prostate cancer during their lifetime. There is a good survival rate, though, with a 91% survival in five years, and most men will die with prostate cancer rather than from it. And we'll put up our next polling question here. So where is the most common location for prostate cancer to arise within the prostate gland? So I'm going to stop the polling there and share the results. So good job, everyone got mostly correct. It is the peripheral zone. So about 75 to 80% of prostate cancers are located within the peripheral zone. And the prostate is broken down into four different zones like you can see in the diagram on the PowerPoint there with the peripheral zone, central zone, transitional zone, and anterior zone. So the transitional zone would be the second most common site for prostate cancer to occur, making up approximately 13 to 20% of the cases. Prostate cancer is also a lot of times multifocal, and some risk factors associated with it would be obesity, age, race, and family history. So I'll put up our next polling question here. Which of the following genetic mutations is not associated with an increased risk of prostate cancer? Okay, so I'm going to end the polling there and share the results. So it looks like most people picked BRCA2, and unfortunately, that's not the correct answer. 
So the correct answer is actually APC, which is familial adenomatous polyposis. And that one is not usually associated with an increased risk for prostate cancer. It is, however, 100% lifetime risk for colorectal cancer. The MSH2 or MLH1 is Lynch syndrome. So that one will be associated with increased risk for prostate cancer, as well as a high risk for colorectal cancer, and then also endometrial cancer in women. BRCA2 is associated with an increased risk for prostate cancer, as well as breast cancer, specifically male breast cancer. And then HOXB13 is also associated with an increased risk for prostate cancer. So another important pathology to discuss when talking about the prostate gland is benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is benign nodular enlargement of the prostate gland. And this happens primarily in the transitional zone versus how we saw with the cancer, that one's usually the peripheral zone. So you can see there on the PowerPoint, the image first one showing a tumor located within that peripheral zone. Then the central photo there showing a normal prostate with a nice patent urethra. And then the last one there showing an enlarged prostate and that would be representative of benign prostatic hyperplasia. And you can see that the urethra there is very compressed by that prostate gland. So it's blocking that urine from exiting the bladder. So BPH is treated with a TERPS procedure, which is a transurethral resection of the prostate. And this is done by putting an instrument up the end of the penis through the urethra. And at the end of this instrument is a electrical wire loop that cuts the tissue out to relieve the urinary symptoms associated with BPH. This is not done for prostate cancer, but sometimes we can get incidental prostate cancer in these TERP specimens. So I'll put up our next polling question. Which of the following is a concerning feature for prostate cancer in a TERP specimen? Okay, and I'll end the polling there. Uh, so yes, it does look like most people did get it correct. It is yellow coloration. So another uh, one would be as if there was a white firm area, that would be also concerning for uh, prostate cancer. So here is a couple images of a typical TERP specimen. So most of the time they are multiple pale tan dash pink tissue fragments. And these ones look both very normal. There's no yellow coloration or white firm areas. So this one would be our images just showing different gross appearances for prostate cancer and benign prostatic hyperplasia in a radical prostatectomy specimen, like the one that we have out here today. These are the cut surfaces of the prostate gland. So the first one there is showing benign prostatic hyperplasia with diffuse nodules. And then the one with the blue background is showing prostate cancer with a nice obvious mass. And then the central photo there is showing a specimen that has prostate cancer as well as benign prostatic hyperplasia. And I wanted to put this one up just so that you guys can see how difficult it is to distinguish between benign prostatic hyperplasia and prostate cancer. So a lot of times with these specimens, we're going to be submitting a lot of samples. And we'll talk about that a little bit later once we go through the grossing. So now we'll go on into talking about how we open or fresh these specimens. So we'll first start by taking the weight of the specimen, and then we'll want to inject formalin using a syringe into all four quadrants of the prostate. And we'll do this evenly so that the prostate does not get distorted in size at all. And we want to inject the formalin into the prostate to allow the formalin to enter into the prostate parenchyma to let it fix before we gross it. Now we'll go into the grossing steps. So first we want to make sure that our patient identifiers are all correct. Then we want to make sure that we've checked our clinical history for why the specimen's out. And for this one, it's out for prostate cancer. 
and then we'll go through the specimen, the ink code, main findings, and section code. So our specimen, so we already said it. So it's a radical prostatectomy specimen. So it includes the prostate gland and we'll take measurements from the base to apex, then from the medial to lateral, and then from anterior to posterior. We'll also take measurements of both of our seminal vesicles, as well as our vasa deferent. So our ink code at our institution is that we use blue for the right half, and that would be for the right portion of the prostate gland, as well as the right seminal vesicle and right vas deferent. Black is what we use for the left half, and then we use a green anterior strip down the center of the prostate. So this strip will go from the opening of the urethra on the base and then as well on the apex. And you can see that on the diagram there. And the probe is just going through that center of the urethra. So now we'll go into how we section these prostate specimens. So first we wanna start by removing the seminal vesicles and vasa deferentia without cutting the base of the prostate. Cut off these guys. And then we would like to cut off the prostatic apex and we wanna keep this about 0.5 centimeters in thickness because we're gonna be doing perpendicular sections. Then we'll serially section the mid prostate in about 0.3 to 0.4 centimeters transverse parallel sections like shown on the diagram in the PowerPoint. And we wanna maintain all of the margins on each one of our slices. We'll lay out these slices going from apex to base and we'll section until we get to that prostatic base and we'll wanna leave that again at 0.5 centimeters in thickness. So now that we have all of our slices laid out nicely, it's a good time to assess the prostate parenchyma to look for any dominant nodules or not. So the one on the right-hand side showing with the red arrow there has a nice dominant nodule. So we would document that and describe its size and location. So now we'll talk about how we section the apex and the base. We want to do perpendicular sections. So if you look at that diagram there with the rings and the line, that would be imagining if you're looking right down over top of the base or the apex. The central circle there is the urethra. And our first cut will be right through the center of the urethra. Then we're going to continue our cuts going from the right and to the left, basically making mirrored images as we cut. We'll want to mark the medial sides of the tissue so that those sides are the sides that are embedded down in the cassettes. And that would be the side that the pathologist would be looking at underneath the microscope. So here is a image showing how we would submit that apex and base. And you can see those mirrored images there with the central line being the urethra that we cut through. And then we would want to be submitting the right half going from midline to lateral. And then we'd submit the left half going again from midline to lateral. So for submitting the remaining prostate, so we always wanna submit going apex to base. So we'd start by submitting our apex like we just showed in the previous slide. And then we wanna submit our mid prostate slices. And we'd submit these either in halves, quarters, sixes, or eights depending on the size of the cross-section. So if we have a really large prostate, then we're going to have to probably be doing sixes or eights, just so that those pieces of tissue fit nicely into the cassettes. We'll also wanna be submitting in a clockwise fashion for each slice. And at our institution, if the prostate gland is less than 50 grams, we're going to submit it entirely. If it's over 50 grams, then we're going to be doing alternating slices. And so for our specimen today, this one is actually 80 grams. So we would be doing alternating slices. So you can see on the picture there, you can see the red circles. So those would be the slices that we would be submitting with the alternating slices. 
we'd always still want to submit our apex and base entirely. And then we want to serially section and submit our bilateral seminal vesicles and vasodeferentia. So here's a sample gross description of a prostate gland. So we'll have what our specimen includes. So our prostate, our left and right seminal vesicles, our right and left vasodeferentia, and then our inking code. And our main findings will be if there is a dominant nodule or not. And then as well, our cassette summary. So our specimen will either have been in submitted entirely or every other slice would be submitted. And we start with submitting our apex going from right half and then our apex left half. And then once we get to our slices, then we'll want to indicate exactly how we submitted each of those slices. So like I mentioned before, we'll do it in a clockwise fashion. So the LA just means it's submitted from left anterior, left posterior, right posterior, and right anterior. And then we'll submit the base going from the right half, and then the base going from the left half, and then the left seminal vesicle and vas deferens, and then the right seminal vesicle and vas deferens. So now we'll go on into the staging for prostate cancers and we'll put up our next polling question. What PT stage is a prostate tumor that invades the seminal vesicles? Okay, so I'm going to end the polling there. So it looks like it's a tie for PT3A and PT3B. So now let's go through and talk about these. For prostate staging, it's important to note that there is no T1 stage. It starts with T2 and that's organ confined. T3 is then extra prostatic extension. T3A is extra prostatic extension, either unilateral or bilateral or microscopic invasion of the bladder neck. T3B is when that tumor invades the seminal vesicles. And then T4 is when the tumor is fixed or invades onto adjacent structures other than the seminal vesicles. So this would include the external sphincter, rectum, bladder, levator muscles, and or pelvic wall. So now just talking about some prognostic factors related to prostate cancer. For tumor size, so if the size is larger, then it's going to have a worse prognosis. The Gleason score is the grade for prostate cancers. And the grade of a cancer is based on how much the cancer cells resemble normal healthy cells. So the higher the score, the more aggressive cancer with a poor prognosis. Stage and margin status are also important. And then a cribiform morphology and intraductal carcinoma are also associated with a poor prognosis. So I just want to thank everyone for attending today's session. Thank you.